Yeah. I'm going to start recording, but I am not capturing the um, Jitsi room. I'm just capturing what we're seeing here, just so you know. Um, I'm curious, was there, no. Alex, how, did, how long does it take to make one of these work? Any of you curious about me? Well, uh, most people secretly can't make a period. Um, I had a team of ladies, um, 30 people working on it for two months. Yeah. That's awesome. Wow, just in the playoffs in this room. Yeah. That's incredible. Oh, we're pushing that forward. Okay, cool, baby. But we're pushing all sorts of that forward. And we have a lot of surprises still coming ahead of us for the next few days. So, uh, um, this becomes a It's kind of a fireside chat between Amanda and Oh, you're so curious. Is there a particular curiosity you have today? Yeah. Let's turn it on. Uh, I'll let you get ready. Uh, I've been cool. around a little bit. I mean, I'm just so... Oh, okay, cool. Uh, awesome. Like, I can, I can only just imagine yeah. every time you're all very exciting to me. I'm loving it. It's, it's interesting because it's like we can transfer into a little bit. Hey, Amanda, it's all working smoothly now, so they're seeing and hearing us well. Oh, great. Thank you. Hello, how are you? I'm doing well, and we're we're actually an art bus, so there are five of us watching through my screen right now. Wow. That is cool. Well, hello, art bus. Mostly Amanda's friends here in the room. So we wanted to make sure to catch it. I'm hugging you. Aw, thanks. Who's talking to you? Do know each other? So we're going to say Skype. Right here. Let's go. Hey, yeah. Well, okay. I think we're going to do Skype. Last year called the Synchronous Institute. Oh, I know. I didn't know. Which focuses on doing research to understand synchronicity, like how we're applying from a scientific perspective. It's so busy now. I'm going to apply that to activism. It's climate activism. So what is activism? All right. All right. Good luck, y'all. Have fun. Because, because when we, so synchronicity can, uh, applies to activism when we make an effort to do any, sorry, it's loud. When we, when we, when we so you can tell when the, ju in the Jitsi room we're muted. I'm going to keep it on mute now. flexible in the path. We, we experience synchronicities which help us achieve yes. our goals. Mm. It's a whole different worldview. I think they're actually going to hop on stage. Yeah. Mainstream. I'm to your left. I totally agree. How's it going? I can say that that speaks to the heart. All right. My Feels like, uh, Great. you want to meet on stage in about one minute? Say. Two minutes? All right, cool. Great. Brian, you want to meet on stage in a minute? Sure. Great. Joe, nice to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm back. I'm back. Nice to meet you too. Okay. I'm right behind you. Let's talk about Sky. Yes. Yeah, it's happening. Yeah, he's here. Is it happening or is it starting? Yeah. It's going to start right now. Yeah. Right, and then. Yeah. Good thing. What is it? Something, yeah. something we can have in our lives all the time. How's it going? But we forget about it when we're in our normal day to day life. I'm good. I'll, uh... yeah, it's been hard to do it lately. Hard to hear from here. Is it because of the intense ang the anxiety of the world com imposing on it on us? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's nice. Give me eyes and dressers. Hey guys. Are you are you teaching us the Qigong you learned? What <laughs> that's a bad practice. Going from that stress. You're coming in kind of soft. Oh, right. And the more of us can Am transition I? I can back speak to the state, 
try. Yeah, I think we'll have to have you speak louder. Obviously, we'll do the the on air function, but. Who is your hand? Yeah. Helium, yeah. <laughs> right. I, I heard discovered that too. That was, uh, yeah, that's crazy. I gotta look more into that. That's just sounds like a bunch of grown-ups talking to people's minds. Um, I'm recording yeah. the audio. Ryland, are you doing the same? Being able to be more alert and uh, in tune with what you're feeling right. allows you more control. Uh, uh, Brian, is there a, the uh, audio recording? Yeah. For adjusting that. Uh, so how we feel completely so affects you can see our effectiveness at actually making any kind of positive change. Yeah, it's really good about going up and just feeling it's cool. What? Whoa. Got a big cool. That's wonderful. And that's that. I appreciate what you said there. I mean, with the headset, I'm like, it's tricky. Yeah. I feel like I, I, I'm on the verge of, like, electrocuting myself. I could have a conversation with It's fascinating to hear them go through it. I guess you need a strong metal strong. Yeah, this is a great world. Okay, and I have a world called University of Okay, Yeah, Yeah, Hello, everyone. Welcome to Playa Alchemist. Thank you all for, for being here uh, in this uh, virtual world of ours. Um, we know you could literally be not only in any place in the physical world, but any of the many virtual worlds and and you chose to be here and that means so much to us um i'm wondering if and this is also good practice can we take a moment and, and do a little emoji heart or a clap or whatever you want to express to the built team that built this beautiful beautiful pyramid um it has been quite an honor surprise to 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 be able to really enjoy the playa in in this way um so I can't thank them enough, um, and um, yeah, thank you for helping me thank them. Um, so, a little bit about Playa Alchemist, and also, can we get a maybe a raise of hands if you are new to Burning Man? If you've never been to Burning Man, this is your first burn. Thank you, you and G. All right, all right, cool, great, um, awesome. Everyone that has been to Burning Man. Um, you know, it, it would mean a lot to me. I think I think this year is the year where we really get to enculturate and connect with a lot of new burners this year. And so, um, as as we go about the week um, and and even this this session, it would mean a lot to me. And I think for all of Burning Man as a whole to really welcome in these newbies. Um, I know Burning Man means so much to me. That's why I'm here in virtual reality. I'm I'm guessing it's similar for you. So. Um, let's let's show them what Burning Man's all about uh, and give them a warm welcome. So here at Playa Alchemist, we go by the motto of transform yourself to transform the world. And these two speakers we have today really, really, truly exemplify that. Um, and I'm really, really, truly honored. Um, hey guys, just really honored that you guys are here with us today. Thank you so much. Um, and um, in in this virtual virtual world, um, we're gonna I'm gonna interview both of them. Um, I I think it's just so important to understand who they are and where they came from and how how they got to doing the really inspiring work that they're doing. Um, and then we'll break up into some Q and A with both of them on stage. Um, yeah, um, is this, Sound coming in. Any any requests before before we really get started? Cool. Thank you, Alex. It's Alex, it's really good to see you here. Um, if we could give a little heart love to this man, Alex here um, and Crystal, uh, they've they've really made this pyramid happen this year in this virtual way. Um, so 
Thank you both. Um, all right. So Amanda. what we're going to do is I'm going to interview Amanda first, and then we'll get to Rylan. Um, Rylan, I, I figured out here, I'm actually going to whisper. Uh, Rylan, if you want to put your headset on backwards, you can and listen in or just like cover up thing in case you want to take it off and just chill out. But it'd be really cool if you listen. Yeah, definitely. I'm listen. Great. This is, uh, I, I think what I've really enjoyed about, um, my favorite thing about this virtual plot is that I'm constantly learning and, and everything's an experiment just like it would be in virtual Burning Man. So I hope you guys lean into that because um, I actually think that that's what makes Burning Man special is, is the learning and figuring things out and we still get to do that here and um, it's been a powerful experience. So here we go. Um, Amanda, if you want to come up a little closer here on stage and and um, we'll we'll get to chat. Um, so, um, you know, actually, Amanda's big, kind of a big part of my life. I don't I don't know if she knows it, but I met her at Burning Man um, in 2013. And um, at the time, I was living in India, and I came to Burning Man from India, and I was like, hey, I want to move to San Francisco. And she was like, okay, great. Do you have a place? Um, I was like, no. And we, we had maybe hung out. We had gone on like a group adventure with like 10, 15 people, one or two nights of, of, of Burning Man that year. And um, she being the gracious, warm hearted person that she is. And I, you know, I didn't really even know what she was working on at the time. Um, she was like, well, you can, you know, crash, crash with me and my roommate while, uh, while you figure this out. So <laughs> I, I go to San Francisco, um, and I end up living on her couch for, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, but it was, I think it was close to six weeks. And I don't, I mean, if you posted someone, that's a long time to have somebody you just met at Burning Man <laughs> for a couple of days. Um, and we became a little family. It was a beautiful little family. And it was actually so good. I wasn't really looking that hard for a new place because I actually just was loving my life living on their couch. So that, that's why it took me so long. I mean, yes, San Francisco housing at the time was tough, but um, they were just a delight to live with. And I really, uh, I, I think there's something special when you get really close to someone and they impress you more, you know? I, I think, um, I don't know if that's true enough. I don't even know if that's true enough with, for, for myself when people get to know me. Um, but when I got to know Amanda, the closer I got to know Y'all in the, the Jitsi room, her, you can talk um, freely, by I the was, way. I was truly blown you away. don't have so to stay on mute. This conversation is really special because we met socially and we're, we're kind of friends first. Um, and so I actually get to learn a lot about her and her life um, in this conversation because I've never really I, you know, I don't know if I've like really read your bio or, you know, just kind of these more formal things. Um, and so excited to be here. So thank you for being here, Amanda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for having me. Hey, Ryan. Um, your voice is coming in a little soft. It is. Okay. I can enunciate and speak louder. That's okay. Uh, Yunji, is it just me? Can you... Can everyone hear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, great. It's just me. I'll, I'll uh, just stand close. Um, great. So, so Mina, where, where were you born? <laughs> I, I really, I really don't want to take it way back because I'm, I'm excited to actually interview you and get to know where this all started. <laughs> great. I was born in a public hospital in Abidjan. Geography quiz for you. The capital of. Ivory Coast in West Africa. Um, my grandparents were missionaries there, and then my parents uh, did their anthropology work there, and then were uh, professors at the University of Abidjan. And that's where I was born. Wow. Wow, and um, how long were you there? How, how was that? 
I was there for the first four years of my life. I spoke French and it definitely impacted me. Um, I'm what they call a third culture kid. So you have your first culture, which is your passport country. Your second culture is another country, country where you grow up. And then when you come back to your first culture, it's as though it's a, it's a third culture. So Barack Obama is also a third culture kid. We're kind of out of the box thinkers you know, high in empathy, and uh, yeah, we're a, we're a specific breed. And then I also went to high school in La Paz, Bolivia, and lived in Haiti in the Dominican Republic as well. Oh, wow. I did not realize that. When, um, when did you end up in the States? I uh, spent a lot of my childhood in Washington, D.C., but then I came to the States for college. Um, but then I went back and lived with, in Bolivia, and that's really when climate change kind of hit home. Um, when I was there after college and experienced multiple thousand year weather events, um, and you shouldn't be able to say that sentence because they're supposed to only happen every thousand years. Um, and I was working in poverty alleviation and, and, and these landslides actually took out the homes of some of the wood. And I realized that climate was kind of this multiplier effect on so much of what we're trying to do to make the world a better place. If we don't deal with climate well, then literally things get washed away. And how old were you when this, when, when these, you found these, uh, yeah, that is a crazy sentence. Multiple thousand year events. When, when, how old were you when you experienced this? That was when I was 22. So it's been about 15 years that I've been working in climate change really focused on the solutions. My middle name is Joy, and I am just really always focused on kind of the silver lining and the opportunity. And when I learned about climate, kind of immediately gravitated to what are we going to do about it? Um, and I dedicate myself to that. And that's what I've been working on for the last 15 years. Wow. And so what, I mean, where, like, where do you, where do you start? You, you have this feeling you have this urge, and where did you decide to get started? How did you get started? I, I, I guess, where did you almost get the audacity to just want to work on something and so big? Mm -hmm. mm, I kind of just looked around and didn't see many other people doing it. Um, you know, I was working, immediately I went and worked with AmeriCorps and did an AmeriCorps fellowship here in the States and then um, worked for 350.org, which is a climate activist organization. And it was just constantly on the page where all the solutions were. And I was just always looking like, what is like the comprehensive plan? How are we going to get out of this? How are we going to get to 350 parts per million? And all the plans that I was seeing were just um, energy focused, not looking at land and material and population and family planning and all the things that I knew were part of the equation. Um, so in 2013, I started a nonprofit called Project Drawdown with Paul Hawken, and we created this New York Times bestselling book called Drawdown. And it's 100 different solutions to climate change. The subtitle is the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. And you'll find that 12 of the top 20 solutions we found are all food and agriculture based. Um, if you look across history, it's actually, we have more emissions that come from our land use than we do all fossil fuel use combined. Um, not to say we don't need to do something about fossil fuels, but there is a huge leverage point in increasing the sinks, the ability of, of land to hold more carbon and also reducing the emissions that are coming off of land use projects and, and farms. That's amazing. Um, why is it called Drawdown? It's called Drawdown because Drawdown is the point at which we start to take more carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere than we're putting in every year. And so that enables us to come back down to draw down that carbon uh, back into living systems. So as many people probably know, we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. We're losing so much and including that we're losing so much biomass. Uh, 
uh, whether that's plant life or animal life. And so we can bring this carbon and kind of mine it. Of course, that's a little bit of an attractive metaphor to use, but we can mine the carbon out of the sky and put it back into life by dry. Awesome. Awesome. So I guess uh, where where are we with with climate change? What like I guess maybe it's easier to ask as a personal question. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like it, that's dumb. Like I mean, I feel like this is a scientific question. So I don't. Why would I ask you as a personal question? Where where do scientists say that we are objectively? Like this is should be an objective question. Let's answer objectively. Yeah, we are just over one degree grade increase globally, average global temperatures above pre-industrial levels. And there's always been a chant within climate activism that says 1.5 to stay alive. We really need to stay below 1.5 degrees uh, on average global temperature uh, increase. And if you look at the new drawdown report that just came out this year, we can actually peak at 1.5 at uh, in about 2043 and so we are firmly what i call in the awkward era where the <laughs> bad news is getting worse obviously those of us in california have been experiencing the fires the extreme weather is going to come for a couple more decades even in the best case scenario um, but also the good news is getting better so Bad news getting worse, good news getting better. We're firmly in this kind of awkward era of uh, knowing that we have the solutions, which Rylan will talk about uh, as well. But we have the solutions to, you know, put the carbon back into the ground, to, you know, democratize and, and make renewable all of our energy grid. Um, but it's going to take a while. There's going to be kind of like a buffer and a lag with all of those solutions kind of, you know, gaining market share and everything like that. So we're in this era where it's really really important that we don't feed apathy i think that's one of the most dangerous um kind of problems in climate change is all of us feeling like we need to give up because it's just too hard uh, so anything you can do to feed your curiosity and your courage and your will and that of those in, uh, around you is really vital right now yeah i'm almost inspired i guess what the being said is I'm curious if we could uh, Yunji can we ask the audience if, if there's any kind of question they have on this topic of you know, what, what is something they could do what what keeps them from doing something I, I feel like um, that, that feels like a important point for us to kind of almost engage with the audience with sure do you want people to raise their hands yeah, I think, uh, uh, you, you, oh, great. All right. Can we take, uh, synchronicity skies? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me all right? Um, if you could speak you, up. Uh, go ahead and click on the raise hand button and we can uh, get you on megaphone so everyone can hear you. Great. There you go. All right. Okay. And so great. Thank you. Thank you for that last discussion there. Um, my name is Sky Nelson Isaacs, and I started an organization called the Synchronicity Institute because I'm a physicist and I study the phenomenon of synchronicity, which is really just the phenomenon of how we get opportunities at the right time. And it's uh, something that can really change the way that we look at our lives and the world, I think. We experience it on the playa all the time. And I want to bring that up because you just said, you know, the most important thing, more than changing the amount of climate carbon we use, is not feeding apathy. And I think having a, a new worldview, a, a new way of looking at the world, which is something we do here at Burning Man, is really important for changing the amount of curiosity, courage, and will that we choose, rather than the sense of hopelessness and helplessness. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have? Yes. Uh, do I agree you with you. Is there a question in there? Or, well, do you have tools that you particularly use use for um, keeping yourself motivated? going you know from a place of helplessness to a place of curiosity or courage mm -hmm. beautiful thank you for that thank you beautiful yeah if you look at um dana meadows wrote a really great book called thinking in systems and she talks about 10 of leverage points to intervene in a system and the most effective one being kind of at the level of paradigm or mindset or you know kind of culture 
And it's so important that we kind of feed that understanding that that paradigm, that mindset, that we can get through this and that if we take a living systems approach and really look to the world, not in this reductionist, you know, overly reductionist, simplified, kind of mechanistic way of the old paradigm, which is so based on competition and othering, and I can only benefit at your expense into this kind of new paradigm, what you just spoke to of, you know, what we experience here at Burning Man, of mutualism, of shared, you know, a, a win for all game dynamic. So there's a couple different tricks that I use. Um, one is like when the grief comes, let the grief be and try not to get into the secondary emotions of feeling guilty about that grief or, or um, you know, feeling fatigued about it, just kind of letting the emotions go and flow through you. And I find that when I let the grief kind of come through me, but in a way that feels like dignity, where I'm standing tall in the grief, um, it can actually be very empowering. And I reach out to community more. I get more fascinated with how things are working around me. And the grief can actually fuel, um, fuel a better, deeper understanding. But if in grief and kind of apathy, then, you know, I kind of like slump over and, um, you know, kind of get lost. And so one of the things that I like to do is within the Buckminster Fuller Institute, we're finding people all over the world who are kind of in tune with what Bucky did in terms of looking to nature as design, like the geodesic dome. This is actually an octahedron somewhat based off of Buckminster Fuller's work, uh, this pyramid or half an octahedron that we're in right now. You know, he's looking to nature as design, and we're finding all of these projects all over the world. Um, if you go to regenerosity.world, that's a project of the Buckminster Fuller Institute where you can learn about all of these incredible projects uh, per the kind of awkward era frame earlier. There's, the good news is getting better. There's more and more and more people tuning in uh, and doing uh, the work to recreate our ecosystems and improve livelihood uh, for people all over the world. Um, you know, facing kind of a, a systemic approach where you're not just looking at carbon, but also trying to increase biodiversity and cultural diversity and break cycles of oppression. Um, so go to regenerosity.world. Feel fed every day by the projects that we're supporting and, and finding. Um, and so, yeah, just watch where you're coming from. Basically, like, you are what you eat. You also are what you read. And so just be careful where you're getting your information from and, and try to saturate yourself in so solutions and systems and strategies that are kind of, of the future that you want to live in. For the heart. Are you there still? Oh, oh, sorry. I'm okay. mute. I, I mean, I just did some beautiful things, but I'll try to say that. <laughs> um, I, I'd love to take a pause and um, drill down on why you think grief is so important to connect with and, and, and work with. Um, it, it really hit me on, on uh, the, the link there, and I, I think it'd be really powerful to, to take a moment and um, can I explain why why that's so important for the work you're doing and being who you are and maybe even a larger sense um, related to to the climate <laughs> yeah I think it's you know there's so much to say about this but oh, it's really sad we're losing a lot you know in the best case scenario still involves a lot of loss. And if we're not grieving with it, then we'll maybe feel disappointed as more and more loss hits us. You know, we're in the midst of kind of this quadruple crisis of COVID and climate and capitalism and colonialism, all four kind of intertwining right now. and. It's really important to kind of face how we got here and grieve that we've all been part of a really effed up system. And I think grief helps us both face where we've come from 
but then also the flip side of grief is praise. If you've ever read any of Martine Prechtel's work, he has a book called The Smell of Rain on Dust, where he talks about grief and praise kind of being roommates, the landlord of their apartment being love. And I think grief is a really critical part of being a, a health human. Um, you know, I'm a queen of silver linings. I love looking at the positive side of things and seeing the possibility. That also comes from a intimacy with depression and anxiety and, and knowing just how sad it is to experience heartbreak and loss. And <laughs> crying in a VR headset is funny. <laughs> wow, um, I, um... <laughs> Beautiful to experience so much emotion in VR. Thank you so much for expressing and feeling and sharing this moment with us. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of resources. Joanna Macy's work that reconnects is also a really powerful uh, way to kind of experience grief. You go through gratitude first and then grief, uh, seeing through new eyes and moving forward, and then it's a spiral. Um, so always kind of coming back and, and allowing yourself to feel. Actually, at Burning Man several years ago had a moment on an art car at sunrise where I was just feeling the weight of the world as I do. Um, and I had this moment of like, oh, it's all falling apart and unraveling so that we can see that it's all interconnected and just how interwoven everything is. And so in the unraveling, in our in our seeing that um you know the health of the oceans is, is connected to the health of of everything else in the world got two ocean it's over here in the boom, green boom, bean bag um in the unraveling we're actually seeing how closely knit everything is um so i think the grief helps us face and and know and understand where we are yeah wow yeah Thanks. um that's powerful. Um, I, I know a question was asked. We're actually going to take questions a little bit later. Um, I mean, I, I, that was um, for me, just for me personally to connect grief with climate change. That, that was really powerful. Um, and so I think I feel good. Um, feel good here. Is there anything you want to, sh we'll do Q&A with you and Rylan, but is there anything else you want to share before before I switch out to Rylan? Mm, yeah, I'll just say if people want to learn more, um, the Buckminster Fuller Institute, we're putting together a new online course. It's called Trim Tab Space Camp, how to be a better crew or astronaut on spaceship Earth. And this next course, we're looking at decolonization, climate justice, uh, futurism and design science. So really kind of looking, we have all BIPOC uh, instructors with us and kind of really trying to look at that, that um, four-pronged crisis that we're in, colonialism, capitalism, climate, and COVID. Uh, so I invite you all to join. You can go on to our website, bfi.org. And uh, we'd love to have you all there. Thank you. And we'll come back. Thank up you. For questions in a bit. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Yeah. Uh, uh, I love you. Virtual hug. I appreciate it. I love you. Oh, oh, there you go. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hey, Rylan. Hey, guys. Um, why don't we take a minute and just meet one person that's next to you um, and, and stretch. I'm, I, I was going to stretch by myself, but I thought maybe we could all stretch. Mm -hmm. <sighs> mm. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Rylan, thank you so much um, for, for joining us today. Um, I'm, I'm excited to learn more about you. Um, I, uh, I, f I feel like I've been a a aware of, of you and your work for years, and, and I'm excited to, to get to know you a little bit more, um, especially in this format. And I think it's actually beautiful that um, Amanda shared about grieving. I, I think I think it's an interesting connection um, that, that may come up a little bit later. Um, so, similar question to you. Where, where were you born? 
Uh, before I before I go into that, I just would love to just I don't know if Amanda's still here or can hear, but I just um, yeah, just am so grateful for you, Amanda, for bringing us into or bringing me into my heart um, and bringing uh, yeah a that state of um, grief and humility and um, yeah, just bringing us into a humble state of being. You know, in the stupor of the reality that we're in, and not that we need to be stuck there or, um, you know, um, imprisoned there, but to be able to be humbled such that we can um, come up from our our crying eyes to see the new possibility. And uh, I just, I, I, Amanda has been a, a kindred spirit, and uh, it's really great to share this stage and this space with you and i've always been hearing from afar and it's really beautiful to hear your heart and hear your voice and just again feel even more kindred than i did from afar so thank you uh so back to where thank, i was born yeah, yeah. thank you for that that was that was so eloquent and beautiful i was i was moved thank you yeah, and um, yeah, I'm just I'm grateful um, for this opportunity. It, it's it's kind of wild, awkward, silly, um, but real beautiful. And I'm just yeah, I'm really grateful that I get to be here with all of you. So thank you. Uh, thank so you. I was born. Thank you both. Uh, yeah, I was born in uh, Lincoln, Vermont, um, to two midwives in a home. Uh, my parents drove uh, four hours from where they were living in uh, upstate New York to uh, meet with a midwife, and I was born in Lincoln, Vermont. And I actually went back to Lincoln, Vermont to find my midwives uh, about four years ago. And I went back to the town of Lincoln, Vermont, which is, I don't know, I think population 1100, and uh, I went into the general store and I asked where. Um, uh, where my midwife lived or if they knew who my midwife was and they gave me the direction of where she lived and actually while I was in the store a woman walked in with kids and they said oh yeah these kids were born also from that same midwife so wow <laughs> yeah I was a, it was a that's so cool um, yeah coming home and finding finding the the person who brought me safely into this world and so a beautiful a beautiful little adventure I went on about four or five years ago so yeah you know i'm curious what what inspired you to find your midwife i i uh was born in a hospital so you know i've never felt inspired to find the the person who delivered me of course a midwife is different so I'm, I'm very curious what inspired that journey for you uh i was taking my wife back to um my hometown ithaca new york which is where i grew up for the first 18 years of my life and uh, I was also taking her to a place called Vinyl Haven, Maine, um, which is where I would go uh, when I was a kid uh, to see my grandparents. And uh, we were stopping and seeing a friend in Vermont. And I had always um, knew that I was from Vermont, but I didn't really know that much more about it. And then when I asked some questions to my parents, they said, yeah, your midwife was uh, lives in Lincoln, Vermont. You should look her up and see if you can go find her. And so I said, all right, I'm gonna make that part of my journey. Wow, wow, beautiful, beautiful. Um, thank you, I, you know, I get, we, we chatted, we, Ron and I chatted a little bit before, before this and um, this isn't the first time you've, you've really inspired to, and, and really jumped in um, to do something. I'm, I'm wondering, when was the first time, what's the, kind of the first thing that comes to mind as, as a teenager um, in which in which you, you were just like, I gotta, you have this question you had to answer. Hmm. Hmm. I 
something you would want everyone to remember going through that experience um recalling it now like i can can, like feel it in you even through this real world like how powerful that was for you um feels like maybe there's like a reminder uh yeah i I, I that. I, i think you know hearing um amanda speak about you know some tools you know i have a mantra called commit to what you want Surrender and be grateful for whatever is given. Commit to what you want and surrender and be grateful for whatever has been given. Um, and so it allows me to be empowered each day to commit to you know what 
the opportunity, the challenge, the thing that's in front of me, um, and then surrender. And that kind of speaks to what Amanda was speaking about, you know, to not go into ber berating ourselves and the shame and guilt and diminishing ourselves when we fail or we make a mistake. Uh, you know, part of, again, the last 15 years of my life has been running restaurants, Cafe Gratitude, Gracias Madre. You know, we, we've had a mantra within our business culture when you make a mistake in, in service, you say, Yeah, I made a mistake! <laughs> so, like, again, ridding ourselves of the shame that we oftentimes, let's hide it, let me, let me just, you know, cower in I'm, I, my mistake, but actually allowing ourselves to just celebrate um, and not, not, not ignoring that it's not a mistake, but actually uh, allowing ourselves to learn from it through the celebration and the awareness of um, the mistake. Thank you for sharing. I'm uh, putting on a virtual event for the first time ever when I, I've, I've been making a lot of mistakes. So I'm, I'm going to personally take that on this week. So I appreciate right. that so much. Um, yeah, and you mentioned Cafe Gratitude. What, uh, how are you associated with that? What, what, um, you know, let's start there and then, and then we can kind of catch people up to what it is. Uh, yeah, so Cafe Gratitude uh, was created in 2004 by my mother and father in San Francisco. And within wow. the first six months of it opening, I moved back from Los Angeles um, to join them in the development and growth of the business and worked in the development of the business from one restaurant to um, seven restaurants in the Bay Area from 2004 to 2010. And then, um, again, similar speaking to this um, ability that I've had since, you know, a kid of like, um, we can do this, we can, we can make something happen, we can, we can impact the world, we can, um, we can actually make a real meaningful difference that makes the difference. And I was in San Francisco and I had this very palpable, clear vision of, uh, I want to bring Cafe Gratitude to Los Angeles, uh, to the media mecca of the world, to what a place that obviously creates a lot of trends, uh, some of which, you know, I don't think, you know, many are too proud of, but that a lot of trends come out of there and could we bring a, a, a restaurant, a business model, a food, food, a food culture, uh, um, a, a, a corporation culture um, we call sacred commerce and uh, bringing the sacred and the commercial together. And so um, in 2010, I moved to Los Angeles and opened the first Cafe Gratitude on Larchmont. And then sequentially, me and my brother opened um, seven restaurants over the last 10 years um, here in uh, here in Southern, in Southern California between San Diego and uh, it's beautiful when I um, first San Francisco my friend was like hey I can take you to a restaurant and I was like okay um, and if you gotta come Cupertino I wanna take you to this one particular one um, and, and, and so we ended up the restaurant he wanted to take me to was Cafe Gratitude and I was I had never seen anything like it. I'd never seen a business that had um, not even attempted. Like, I don't know if I've seen that many people attempt it, let alone do it. Um, but if you go to Cafe Gratitude, every menu item, right? You know, it, it's it, there's nachos, but they're bad. But how do you how do you order the nachos? Yeah. It, yeah, so um, you order the nachos by saying, uh, I am honoring. Uh, yeah, the whole, the whole realm of Cafe Gratitude is designed to be a realm of gratitude where everyone who walks in is awakened to an experience of gratitude. And one of the ways we do that is through the menu and through affirmations. And so to order the nachos, you would say, I am honoring. Or to order the mint chocolate chip shake, you'd say, I am cool. Or to order the tacos, you'd say, I am transformed. And then when the server brings that to you, they say, you are transformed, you are cool. Um, and it's playful, it's, 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 
we don't want it to be so heavy handed or significant, but the true part of our commitment and intention behind it is to remind people of their divinity, of their wholeness, of their uh, joy. And so if we can use the transactional nature of ordering and delivering food as a way to uh, awaken people to uh, a state of being uh, grateful or joyful or playful or uh, silly um, or vulnerable, uh, that was really our, the game that we were playing. The game we were playing was can we use a, uh, a retail or a restaurant environment to awaken and nurture conversations and a culture of gratitude. Um, and that's what, we've, that's what we've attempted to do over the last 10 years in Los Angeles and also the Bay Area. Yeah, absolutely. I, I had never um, been into a restaurant in which I was like enculturated to be a better version of myself by simply ordering delicious food that was healthy. Um, and what was beautiful was I was with a friend and the waiter gave us a question. They, right. they gave us a question for us to, to consider of, of like a prompt for our conversation and, and our meal, um, which took our conversation deeper. We became closer together in, in, in that meal. It was, it, was a, it was a whole experience. And I think given the framework of a restaurant, I, I actually don't know what more you could do. Like I, I was just impressed. Like it, it was, um, sometimes you see an idea and you're like, you know, I'd like to add this to it, or I'd like to tweak this, or, you, you know, like, they're almost there, but I had that experience and I was like, wow, they, they think this, they really got it. Um, and, and so thank you on a, on a personal level. Um, it, it was just a, a, a mind blowing experience to see how a business, how an experience can enculturate a person into their own values, into a higher form of themselves. Um, at, at scale, right? Like you, you can have restaurants everywhere doing that. Um, and, and I thought that was really powerful. I, I haven't really seen um, something similar to it. And um, as, especially like 10 years ago, it was mind blowing like, um, wh when I experienced it about, about uh, 2000, yeah, it was 2010. Um, so, so thank you for that. Yeah, um, and, and I'm curious, uh, Amanda shared about grief. You helped start that restaurant on Cafe Gratitude. Um, why gratitude? Mm. Gratitude. Amanda said the other side of grief is praise. Um, and I think praising is our highest state of being. When we're mm -hmm. sincerely, wholeheartedly in a state of praise, um, we want for nothing else. I, I, I imagine all of us have had moments where um, gratitude, we were being gratituded. It wasn't like we tried to generate a experience of gratitude. We were just, <laughs> oh, oh, oh my God, just like feeling, feeling <laughs> up. It, it is, I, I've also had an experience where it was like, oh, to know God is to experience gratitude. Praise, mm. oh, oh my God, oh, oh wow. So I, I, there. I hadn't thought about uh, of this concept of being gratituded. I love that. Um, thank you. I have I actually have gratitude for you uh, in this moment to expand me to that. There's also what I experienced kind of in, in at the restaurant. Um, you know, I'm sure people have seen gratitude journals and the power of gratitude. So there's two sides of it. You're, you're helping people also cultivate this gratitude. Absolutely. Well, kind of like a, a muscle. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. beautiful. Our, the philosophy of sacred commerce, or the, the, our restaurant culture, is really that our thoughts, speech, beliefs, actions, and attitudes um, create our experience of life. 
and gratitude when we're um, practicing cultivating gratitude um, when we're grateful we're full grateful we're mostly seeking for something more desire craving aversion gratitude um, brings us it, it, it actually um, dissolves those wantings for a moment for an instant and so we are in state of presence we're in the state of fulfillment fullness and absolutely just like you said we do uh, exercise we work out gratitude is a muscle of in our consciousness you know what what is is our mind going to go to worry uh to doubt to fear to you know all these options of and there's a there's we have the ability to train our our mind and our consciousness to uh, naturally move and uh, see in all things what can I give thanks for? That's so beautiful. I um, just just to bring it back um, here here at, at this camp, our our, um, our motto is transform yourself to transform the world. And I, I, I was so excited to bring you guys here because I just feel like you've embodied that, and I. I'm just learning so much yeah, from both of you. Um, I, I almost want to, if I had to do this talk again, I'd probably give me grief and gratitude. Um, there's, it's so powerful. Um, I'm curious, um, you, uh, you, you've got something big coming up, something um, really special coming up, um, and, and we haven't even really scratched the surface of it. Let's <laughs> let's start there. Yeah. You've um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're getting people grateful, you're building a beautiful restaurant, you're enculturating and up-leveling people. In L.A., you, you've almost like, you're doing acupuncture on culture. You're like, I'm going to go to L.A. and teach them um, about themselves, really, and, and gratitude, um, which is an amazing mission. And how do you get inspired to start this next thing? Yeah, in, in the spirit of synchronicity and activism, um, uh, I, I made a film called May I Be Frank um, about a man who walked into Cafe Gratitude and um, he was given up on you know much of his life and his relationships were in shambles and he was about 300 pounds and had hepatitis and was in antidepressants for 10 years. And we, uh, we, we asked him if he would want to be part of an experiment. And he said yes. And we ended up making a film about his transformation over 42 days, interacting with Cafe Gratitude and taking on the philosophy and the food. Um, and that film came out. And that film has been seen many times. And through that um, film, uh, I was invited to go to a conference in New Zealand uh, called the Healthy Living Conference. And there I was part of a, uh, in the audience um, called Can Human Beings Sustain Themselves on Planet Earth? And five out of the six experts uh, said no, uh, that, you know, the damage is, uh, you know, that we are heading into a six mass extinction and that uh, the damage is too great and it is irreversible. And the last person who spoke was a guy by the name of Graham Sait and basically said there's a, a there's a blind spot in the climate conversation and that blind spot is right beneath our feet and that blind spot is soil and that we don't understand the way that the bigger ecology of the planet works. We don't understand that photosynthesis and trees and soils and microorganisms in the soil are, are which is technology developed over 500 million years uh, designed to balance our climate and if we could see ourselves human beings as allies to that bigger system that we are a part of um and the way that we manage land which is mostly you know we interact with the the skin of the earth um, mostly through agriculture is the biggest 
kind of um, the amount of acreage that we're in interaction with. Um, and that system of agriculture could actually go from the arguably the most destructive system on the planet, um, degrading our ecosystems, creating um, you know, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, extra exacerbating global warming, to actually the system that could be the great redeemer, that we could actually design an agricultural system um, that understood nature's technology and that we could actually pull enough carbon down out of the atmosphere to draw that carbon down through living plants in the soil and that everyone who eats can be part of that revolution and that we could actually create a regenerative revolution where everyone participated in the healing and the regeneration of our planet. And up until that moment in my life, I thought I was pretty smart about, you know, climate change. I was pretty smart about, you know, solutions. But literally, I had never, I never even fathomed or could understand how life could exist three generations forward based on the path that we were. There was no mechanism. There was no pathway. There was no way forward with, with the exception of some, you know, idea of some technology going to save us. But to see, oh my God, photosynthesis, plants, trees, grasses are sipping carbon out of the atmosphere all day, every day. And if we can actually just support that cycle of drawdown, we actually have a way forward and everyone who eats can participate. This is so freaking exciting. I didn't, there was no way that I had seen a way forward. And then there was a way and it was like, oh my God, there's a way, there's a truth, there's a light. And it was like, oh my God, that's, and, and of course there's, there's been whispers of, you know, understanding the interconnection of life and the web of life. And, you know, there've been whispers of this, but not a clear, wow, I got, I saw the bigger circle coming together. And so literally that moment changed my life. I had an explosion in my heart of seeing the truth and the possibility of this being not just an emergent idea that I was experiencing, but I actually could see the emergent idea becoming understood, adopted, and becoming a universal or an awakened conversation that was happening all over the planet. And that that was how we started doing our agricultural systems, understanding the opportunity and the promise of it. And so I came back to Los Angeles as a restaurateur after that conference, and I just became a evangelist for soil. I just, everywhere I went, I was just talking to people about the opportunity of regeneration of our soils and how that could be the regeneration of our human health, of our animal health, of farmers' economic health, and, you know, being a solution to climate change. And I started telling people, they were like, oh my God, this is so exciting. I, you know, I thought I was very smart about these things. I never heard of this. And so I said, well, you, you know, you can go find out more information online, look up Graham State. And then I started realizing I was sending people online to find Graham State. And then I would look on what kind of media was online at that time, back in 2012, and around this conversation of regeneration and the regeneration of our soils. And there literally was like terrible, bad YouTube videos, like with you know bad angles, bad lighting, bad slides. And I said, okay, this is not gonna work. And I saw the opportunity that would be the change you wish to see in the world i saw okay we live in los angeles we know how to tell stories we know filmmakers we're going to tell a, a narrative a story of how we as human beings can be the regeneration generation that regenerated the planet and so we founded the organization kiss the ground in 2013 um right around when amanda was um you know putting together drawdown um is, is that wild they both it's were like, to, it's total, it's total Amanda, wild. Amanda, uh, we, come, been, come over here, come kindred, over here. Kindred, kindred spirits. <laughs> Absolutely. This is so cool. So you're, so you're yeah, both getting super inspired. We both inspired. got the soil bug around the soil bug. There's many of us. We got the cool. soil bug and just how connected our gut biome is to the soil gut biome. Like human health is climate health, is plant health, is soil health. It's all one. Turns out wow. it's all connected. And 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 the, the 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 kind of thought that has been continuously emerging in my mind is, you know, in many um, circles of 
you know, um, you know, people who are all about elevating consciousness and this idea of like what is going to be the shift, what is going to be the thing that awakens people, and is it going to be like oh everyone just starts loving one another, you know, hopefully maybe, but the thing that I've continued to see is like maybe the awakening, the collective awakening, is really understanding that we, our bodies, is the body of the earth. And the body of the, 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 the soil is, you know, our soil and our guts. And that there is this total interconnection with plants, hit, plant, planet, body, human health, that we start to understand that, which in turn, because we are, you know, invested in being okay and healthy to a, you know, to, to a degree, and, you know, that there's a self-interest there, that that awakening of that what I do out here, I am doing explicitly right here um, that shift of interbeing um, or awakening to our interconnection uh, and really seeing that the way that we can do agriculture and design our systems can actually have a beneficial and regenerative effect on nature that is so beautiful um, and uh, Amanda, where did Amanda? Anyway, she's behind you. Oh, she's behind me. Okay, yeah, I can't steer. I, I guess there's blind spots. Um, but uh, that's so beautiful. I, uh, yeah, I'm. You know, kind of when I, I pick these things, it's it's very intuitive. Um, and then and then it's like, kind of uncovering why why there's that feeling, and and I feel like I'm having that moment of just feeling like this this. You two were just the perfect people to bring together to, to talk about this. I, I'm personally learning so much and I hope you all, t all are, are too. Um, so I, we didn't, I, I guess we didn't get to the big, kind of, we're going to show the, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. Um, I, so the, yeah, go ahead. So oh, yeah, actually, so, I yeah. think there's a weird thing that's about to happen. Like, I, I think we have to do some technical things. Um, I just think we're at like a 75% that this is going to work. Um, okay, great. So do you want to jump straight to that or do you want to share a little bit more? Yeah, no, I'll just say that um, just to, to kind of close the loop on that that realization moment in New Zealand of um, that this, this possible awareness of interconnection, regeneration as possible uh, that kind of was birthed into my heart and mind in that moment um, and seeing that it could be a universally understood and adopted or awakened conversation um, is very exciting, as you said, because on September 22nd, uh, 20 days or 21 days from now, uh, Kiss the Ground, the feature length film, is premiering on Netflix uh, all around the world. And uh, we launched the trailer a week and a half ago, and I think almost 3 million people have watched it so far. And, you know, that's a film about soil. Um, so we're feeling pretty great about that. And, um, so, yeah, I think we were going to maybe try to show the trailer. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And then... um, I want to give a lot of love to Brian here, um, who's, who's with me in person, who's uh, making this all happen. He learned the system yesterday, two days ago. Um, not easy. Um, so just want to appreciate him because um, he's, he's kind of the man behind the curtain. Um, but I also want to take a moment and um, just Generally, I, I really take a lot from the principles. I've learned so much from the principles. I've grown from the principles. And, um, you know, when, when we brought up um, sharing, sharing Kiss the Ground, um, you know, I, I thought about it. I was like, oh, is, is this kind of, um, are we promoting something? Are we decommodifying? And, and so I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this. And, I, and just the truth is, you are starting a movement for a problem that we're all facing and I just honor that so much and I think just like you did with the restaurant that's the social acupuncture we need it is media and so I'm so excited I'm so honored um, that, that we're sharing it here um, and, and if anyone wants to talk to me about that happy to take that but I do want to know everyone know that was strongly considered and um, I, don't, I just don't think it's about commodification in, in any way whatsoever. I think this is about gratitude and grief and uh, 
being, being in a world that we know we could be in. Um, so, so I want to thank you both. And um, let's, uh, so thank you so much. Um, I, I guess I get to say hit it, Brian. <laughs> thank you. Oh, wow. The, uh, all the panels are gone. Oh, wow, this is cool. I'm going to mute myself. Uh, carbon and store it in the soil. We can fix a lot of our climate issues to be bring the CO2 down into a living plant and put it back into the soil where it belongs. Plants working with soil microorganisms, it seems too simple. Healthy soils lead to a healthy plant, healthy plant, healthy human, healthy climate. There could be a way to eat food that heals the planet. The problem isn't the animal. The problem is where the animals are at. How do we take waste and repurpose and reuse it because it's really not waste? The poop has to stay in the loop. Compost is just one of a suite of soil-based carbon capture solutions. We know how to do it. And if we continue to scale over 30 years, we can reverse global running. We can get the earth back to the Garden of Eden that it once was by regeneration. To see biodiversity return to a place that was completely devastated, that gives me hope. Our health and the health of our planet are connected. If you look over here, my neighbor's land that has been chemical fallow, then you look over at our paddocks, you have a diversity of different plant species. Which model do you want your food to be produced from? The answer is pretty simple to me. I'll make you a deal. I won't give up. I'm going to shoot you. Oh, uh, I think I did. Is this starting from the beginning again? 